so in this twin study, which was uh, printed in the Journal of Gerontology, yeah, it definitely showed that leg power was attributable to greater brain health. But here's the difference. Notice I said power. So we've known for long that strength is correlated to longevity, right? So the stronger you are, the better you will be able to stand up, move around and not succumb to a fall in your 80s, right? But leg power or power as a whole doesn't get that much attention. So power, when we're talking about from muscular power, is strength times speed. So what does that mean? It means that explosiveness, right? So your ability to do it, it's usually tested via a vertical jump. So in this study specifically, they showed that both power and speed, uh, power and strength was correlated to a bigger brain. Oh my goodness. I love the specificity on that. Yeah. Because again, we think, okay, well, first of all, you shared that regardless of the type of exercise, it's going to be supportive of good brain health. Mm -hmm. But there are certain inputs that are especially valuable. And so working our leg muscles and minding strength and also power, and we're gonna get more into like, what are the best practices? But I wanna ask you a little bit more about this because with muscle, you mentioned the insulin sensitivity factor. Yeah. And the connection there with the brain. But also what about muscle's capacity itself to kind of function as, an endocrine organ or an organ that's producing chemistry itself. Let's talk yeah, about that part. Exactly. And that's part of the journey. You know, I think that we all see, okay, yeah, just grow bigger muscles. It's not just about the end stage, like increases in muscle size, hypertrophy. It's what's the journey of getting there? So every time we go to the gym and we're engaging in resistance training, what we're doing is with every contraction of your muscle cells, we release myokines and that's what makes it an endocrine organ because myokines are hormones. They're muscle-based proteins, but they're also hormones. And, you know, we can name about 12 right now. We've got um, irisin, we've got cathepsin B, myostatin, and what these, BDNF, which is the most prolific one, what these myokines do is once they're released from the muscle cell, right? And this happens under force. I want to be really clear with that because, there's so many women that are lifting what we call pink weights, you know, one pound, two pound weights that are not doing anything. You have to generate enough mechanical force and tension for your muscles to release these myokines. That's the only place they live. These myokines live in the cells of the muscles. So when we contract our muscles and we release these myokines, they go into the bloodstream and they travel. And we've got receptors, right? We've got receptors all over our body. We've got them in our brain, on our liver, prostate, ovaries, everywhere. And if you imagine receptors and hormones as a key unlock, the receptor is open and the hormone is the key, you put it in, it unlocks amazing things. So these myokines, when they go up in the bloodstream, some of them can cross the blood-brain barrier. Irisin, for example, that's one of the myokines that is like a messenger molecule. When it goes into the brain, that's exactly what it does. And it binds to these different receptors and it helps with different functions of the brain. We have to remember every lobe of the brain is responsible for something different. You've got the frontal lobe, which houses the prefrontal cortex. Uh, then we've got the cerebellum, which is the mini brain, which is involved in posture, coordination, spatial awareness. You've got the temporal lobes, which auditory processing, but also house the hippocampus. So it's enabling them to function better and at their peak. Just think about it the same as how you would work out your legs in different areas. You've got your quads, you've got your hamstrings. You can think about your brain like that. So these molecules, when you are placing your muscles under stress, can act as the pharmacy, releasing all of these little drugs that go into your brain and have positive effects. But not just that, they can also travel to different areas of the body, right? I mentioned prostate. And this is fantastic because I'm now looking a lot into the research of resistance training on cancer mortality. And I actually just posted yesterday a phenomenal article that showed that I think it was around a 30% cancer reduction and cancer reoccurrence 
in colorectal cancer just by doing aerobic activity and resistance training. And this is all comes down to the myokine release. So these myokines can go into different areas involved in you know tumor progression and shrink the tumors. That's so powerful. This everything, every time we look at something it related to exercise and human health and survivability, we keep finding benefits. And this is something that, you know, modern science is affirming, but it's coming at a time we're so inactive, mm -hmm. right? We're becoming more and more sedentary. And it's just finding that we're becoming essentially less human in a way oh, and yeah. what our genes are expecting of us. And so finding all these benefits of exercise and some of the capacities that we need to be mindful of as we're getting older. And so I wanna ask you about some specifics for building that power. If we're looking to get this benefit, we want a thick brain, we want a yeah. bigger brain, a robust brain, great plasticity. What are some of the best practices, right? You mentioned the pink weight phenomenon. That's not gonna be what we're looking at if yeah. we're looking for power. So yeah. what are some of the things that we need to be doing? Well, since power, is the production of speed and strength. We have to work on both of those. So when we're looking at explosive power, we're really looking at how much force can you generate in the fastest amount of time. So it could involve doing a jump squat, for example, with a load. And by the way, you have to be really cautious on your your joints, right? I actually, I actually performed these tasks in January and I did my MCL and my my LCL. So you don't want to be doing these with, you know, any type of plyometrics with weights unless you're really conditioned to do so. But you can do them without weights, right? There is really great evidence to actually show that if you do 20 jumps and this goes into females who are going through this perimenopausal menopausal phase in their life. If you just perform 20 jumps on the spot, not loaded, you can actually grow the bones that you can actually ha have an effect on your bone mass and bone density. And that's involved in explosive training as well. So anything that's really going to get you to push a heavy load in a shortest amount of time is what we're talking about here. Yeah. I, I love this because there's progressions for everybody. So having a good on-ramp is just getting physical literacy with body weight, you know, your body weight squats, mm -hmm. and then you can progress to some jump squats without any additional load. Your body is a load, you know, and in particular, you mentioned jumping. There's so much data on this now and just looking at um, functionality in older age, if people are able to jump. Yeah. And so not losing that capacity. And walking downstairs as well. So a really great exercise is, you know, a box jump, right? Or a vertical jump where you're putting a box up and you're jumping. By the way, it is so hard to do as you get older. I remember being young and I was able to jump really high on a box. And because I've stopped doing that, obviously now there's this, it's like kind of frightening to jump on. I don't know what it is. You run and then you go to do it, but you stop. I don't know if that's a function yeah, of older age. Your brain age. is like, hold up. Yeah, hold yeah. up. You're going to, you're going to snap your legs. So I've actually created a, a task for myself and it's one jump a day. And if I can do one box jump a day, that's it. I feel like I won't atrophy in that area. Mm. And I've been doing it. So box jumps, but also getting up on the box and then jumping down, mm. you know, helping with that acceleration and deceleration, which is something that we need as we're getting older. I watch my parents, right? Um, we've probably both got, well, we've got aging parents, a lot of people listening. And what we find is that I look at my parents and I see them going down steps and I always think, oh my God, I'm just I pray to God that, you know, that they have enough strength to hold themselves or grab onto something as they're going down the steps, if something was to occur. Yeah. Stairs are phenomenal for yeah. so many things. Even that action of going up the stairs, it is going to elicit like the development of like a better VO2 max faster because of that elevation. It's basically like doing a little mini one leg squat each time and you're going up. And uh, obviously coming down as well because of what it requires. It's kind of like there's a big explosion of people training going backwards yep. and doing the backwards sled and all these things. And it's just like that reverse action, you know, lowering yourself and, you know, just finding yourself a flight of stairs, even if it's at home, you know, and, and just kind of engaging with that a few times a week. But I love this with the with the box jump because you said it, 
Yeah. It's a thing if you stop doing it. And that's usually what happens for us over time is, you know, our, our adult selves, like we stop playing, we stop jumping and we'll get what I know what I found myself doing for a time was doing the big stuff, like doing the most important things. I'm going, I'm strength training, I'm walking, you know, all these other things kind of get moved to the side, but just getting little sprinkles of it can help you to maintain that capacity. And so, and I, a, a great exercise, one of the things that I do now um, recently, so if I'm doing like a jump, I'll find some stairs, like maybe five stairs, like in the front of my house, for example, and I'll jump up four, you know, like a box jump style, mm -hmm, I'll jump mm -hmm. up four and then I'll jump one with both my feet together. Yeah. So it's like, boom, boom, like a quick, you know, and then- And even that's going to stimulate osteoblasts. That's in right. The bones, yeah. And then coming down, so I'll just, I'll, another, this is a different exercise. I'll stand at the bottom step I'll step down, then I'll jump straight up. So it's just, and you could do this with a bench, you know, at the gym, you just step down off the bench and then go right into a jump. There's all kinds of cool and interesting ways you can do this and engage your, this kind of muscle mind connection, muscle brain connection. But most importantly, get some jumps in. One of my favorite things to do is jump rope. Exactly. I've seen you do that. Yeah. yeah. Jump rope actually is, you know, when you look at this study specifically on how to train, um, the participants were doing jump rope as well. Um, so anything that involves literally just getting your feet up off the ground and it doesn't have to be high. You can mm, just, that's right. you can, and, and for the jumps, especially for women, if you can jump on the spot 20 times, do that twice a day. It doesn't involve anything. You can do it in your bedroom if you have to. You are stimulating the cells and the receptors of your bone to create new bone cells. Mm one of the symptoms of menopause and perimenopause that occurs. And this is why osteoporosis is so detrimental yeah. for women.